in Alberta. The Saddle Lake Cree Nation says over 200 children died at the Blue Quills Indian Residential School, and they want to find the remains of their missing children. Dear Mom and Dad, I am always hungry. We only get two slices of bread and one plate of porridge. This morning at 2 a.m., he woke us up and started to preach to us on how stupid the Indian was. Seven children ran away because they're hungry. Two from Saddle and one from Frog Lake. Then this morning at 5 a.m., he got us up to go and scrub the basement. It was there I decided I'd like to go home. I went to school three days and since I came here. That's the reason why my father sent me here to work. He said that it's either residential school for my boys or I go to jail. Dear Mom and Dad, please send us if you do not want us to come home in caskets. It was one of the most horrific residential schools in Canada.
Steve's sister, Benigna, sister, the sister that was mean, he used to hit us with this big book. He hit us physically. So I did something bad, according to her. So she come and hit me with that book. And I was old enough now to fight back. So I hit the book when it was flying down like this, come and hit me, I hit that book and knocked it out of her hand. And she ran and got the priest. Now the priest beats you up, eh? That's what he did. So I ran in the back, the stairs go down and back. And I just got to the second step and he kicked me in the back. He chased me and the priest had come in. And I went found tumbling down and fell down in, in the bottom. And uh, I still remember, it's very traumatic. I got knocked out and he was down there. I woke up, he was putting snow on my face. I woke up and I and I sat for a while and I laid for a while till I got my strength. And I jumped up and he tried to hold me. He said, hey, stay, stay, stay. And I ran home. I rested about three times, three miles, eh? And I got home and my father come and seen when I, that I was injured. And he come, he come up here, and he, that's when I said, he talked to him in French, I guess. I don't know what he said, but I stayed home, and uh, my dad was very, very strong and mean man. I, a very strict man. I don't know what he said, but they never heard me again. I come to school again, but I didn't want to come to school. I, I, from then on, I've been, I've never was right. I, with that injury, still. I got a lump there still.
and my friend, we just finished washing the chapel and we were coming out and we were talking in Cree. And she come around the corner. He said, sit here. He told us there's chairs there. So we sat down and we were wondering what's, and he told us, you're dirty, dirty. And my friend said, no, we're not dirty. We take a, we take a shower or a bath every day or every night. We're not dirty. Yes, you are because you're an Indian. You know that Indians are dirty. I never said nothing. She said a few things. She got a good few good slaps. The story that my mother told me when she first arrived at the residential school, she said she was with her mom and she went in and, and they took her in and they washed her up, they gave her a bath and did her hair and cut her hair and then she came out and her mom was still sitting there. So she told, she was, she was four years old and she's like, I'm ready to go now mom and and obviously, you know, her, her mom probably had to tell her that she had to stay. You know, it must have been such a scary time for my mom it must have been a very traumatic for her to stay you know in a place with with strangers and not knowing and her, your mom gone and you never know when you're gonna when you're gonna see her again
To me, it's like yesterday. The pain I carry, the pain I see within the young people every day. What the government has done to us, it is not fair for the little children of today and my community members, the way I see them suffer. No one knows the pain I have, the elders, the pain they carry every day from morning till night. Middle of the night, he used to be waking up to go to dig in a grave. And you know what broke my heart the most? Some of the children were not even dead. They buried them alive. They were kicking on the box, and yet he had to throw dirt. What a horrible, horrible story. We hear of all kinds of stories in the other world. But this is right in our doorsteps. When I was in residential school, I was not allowed to speak a word of the Nesun or else we'd get hit by the roller yardstick over our heads slap both our ears, and today I suffer from of hearing, lack of hearing. There are, there are many, many horrible stories that you people do not know and will never understand unless we teach our children. That is why as older people are here, we are fortunate to tell the stories because this is no lie that we have. Look what the government has done to us. They lied up to now. Now they're exposed. In this world, the news has broken up, broken out. And we are not stopping. You know, the native people, the Nesunkhina, our blood is still flowing and it will never, they will never, ever kill us off because our spirit are still living.
some funny things. But something I saw, I don't know how to ever to explain that. But one day, this would be a probably about one, maybe two o'clock in the morning, I had to get up to use the washroom, the bathroom. So I went there and I coming back and I seen these nuns walking. They were holding candles, they were walking, and ahead of them there was this one nun carrying something. And I can't say, but we can we can all guess what they were doing. That what was that procession and that going like carrying whatever it was they were carrying in a procession going what were they they didn't I don't know if they come back with this but I didn't see them but finally I knew later in years that the children were dying years old in 1946-47 when uh, I was taken from Saddle Lake Reserve, came by, uh, by a truck with other children, forcibly removed from our homes, didn't know where we were going, and driven to St. Paul, uh, resident, uh, Lupo Residential School, about three miles west of St. Paul. Like, I was very young. I didn't know what was going on. I just knew I was being taken away from my home, the only home I knew. And uh, I had two sisters and a brother with me. I mean, my brother was too young. He wasn't there, but my two sisters were there. And uh, brought into the school. I was there till 1957. Didn't finish school. I was in grade 11 when I quit. Actually, I was kicked out of school. But uh, the uh, uh, father, the principal, apologized to me and he said, don't go, you're doing good. And I, I said, I was so stubborn then. I said, no, I said, I'm going. If you kick me out, I'm going. You had one more year left to graduate. That's but right, that's left. right. Eventually, I did finish. You know, we, you know, and uh, I did finish my grade 12 and that, about 1997. Anyway, uh, I, uh, the first, the first year, there was a Father Latour was the principal, 
he was very, very kind. He knew our history, of course. You know that we were we were orphans from an early age. Both my parents had passed away. My maternal grandmother had passed away, and I only we only had our grandfather. And he had nine children, so he had four of us. So it was eleven children that he had, or well, nine and nine and four. Can we? Thirteen, thirteen. Sorry. Sorry, Sophie. You said you were six years old when you were taken to that school. Yes. You also mentioned that you were there were a bunch of other kids taken with you, and you had no choice in this. That's right. You know, and there was a lot of lot of crying, parents and children. I remember that. You know, and we were just confused. You know, what what is going on here? You know, why was this happening? Didn't have a clue what was happening. They, we weren't told why. What didn't you like about the school? How were you treated there? Away, I didn't like being away from my family. We were not allowed to speak our language, for one. We didn't know any English, which was a primary, primary language then. We, only, we were Cree speaking, most of us. There are other children from Lake Offa that were brought into, and you know, Goodfish Lake and Saddle Lake. But you know, most I guess with loneliness, you know, I remember that all the time. Lonely, you know. I know what lonely is. I'm lonely right now because I'm alone again, you know. But you know, like another thing too, like we had the nuns that were uh, that were uh, looking after us in the playrooms. And they weren't very kind, you know. Did you suffer physical abuse? Yes, by? yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. I remember, you know, like fists were being used on us. You know, I remember being fists used on me. And like there was a, a priest in there, you know, after Father Latour left, another priest, Father Roland. And uh, he took me to this uh, cloak room. I must have been about, I don't know, eight, something like that. So I knew, I knew what was going on. He brought me to his cloakroom by myself. Nobody saw what was going on. So his word against mine. Shut the door. And he, he said to me, uh, he says, uh, why, I see your report cards, you know, are not very good. He says, and, and the, the, your teacher is saying that you're not doing very good. And I was so scared of him, you know, and I giggled in fright. And uh, he, fig he thought I was laughing at him. All of a sudden, I seen him, his face just, you know, went and I saw his fist coming at me. And I, I ducked like this and he got me right, you know, right in, uh, instead of my face. He was, hit, he was aiming for my face, I'm sure. You know, because he got me and, you know. In the ear. And you testified against this in court as well. Oh, yes. Uh, and uh, I lost my hearing. I've got a hearing aid right now, you know. And ever since then, like, you know, like I've had suffered through my hearing, you know, because by talk to people, they get, they get, uh, you know, like uh, frustrated, you know, because I can't hear them. I ask them to repeat it, you know. And uh, matter of fact, you know, it just happened lately, you know. And uh, anyway, I've had a hearing aid all my life since then, you know. My grandfather never hit me like that, you know. And uh, he was the only one that that really loved us, you know. And my first grandmother, his wife, but she passed away when I was seven. Those are the only two people that loved us, really, you know. Can you tell us some of your other experiences from the school? You said you didn't know in your uh, in your court statement about the bees. Bees and the flowers. Oh, birds and the bees. Birds and the bees. Yes, that uh, that is something, you know, really, really. It's very uh, emotionally abusive. Like we were, we didn't even know our bodies. We didn't know what what a menstruation was. They call them monthlies or periods, whatever. We didn't know what sex was. 
And like, we used to have showers and we had these canvas uh, things like covering, covering us, co covering each other, like, you know, and we had a shower and that. So we never seen each other. And then uh, we had bathrooms and there was, uh, there was about maybe six, six uh, toilets, they call them. And that there was one there that belonged to the big girls, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, we used to pass by there, you know, those little ones, and it smelled funny, you know, we went by. We were wondering what the heck it was. At one time I, I was nosy and I went in there and I thought, it horror, horrible smell. It. There was this bag in there, you know. And, and uh, so I asked somebody, you know, and they were laughing at me, you know, you know, that's, that's for big, big girls. He said, it's not for you, you know. So eventually, you know, when my turn came, I, uh, we had, there were rags, it, it wasn't like codex now, you know, codex were way back, like there were just little pads in that, eight big pads, but they had rags, you know, and then the girls would use them, I don't know, we used safety pins, you know, okay. <laughs> oh, it's funny. I just remembered that, safety pins, and, and then uh, we put them in these bags and they washed them and then they re recycled them, you know. You reused rags. Yes, they were used rags and that. And you weren't allowed to go back home on the weekends? You're no, no, no. Not until, uh, it was quite a, quite a while. Uh, like uh, my grandfather had to come by a uh, team, it was 18 miles to his school. And so he, he wasn't, he didn't come very often. And uh, when he did come, he didn't have very much money, you know. And we were so glad to be able to to uh, eat our own ethnic food, you know, like ducks and duck soup and stuff like that. Like we weren't, we weren't even, we didn't even know the food that they were giving us at the school, you know, like porridge and, uh, you know, stale bread and stuff like that, and skim milk. They'd skim the milk and that, you know, make cream for themselves. This is uh, Blue Quills Residential School, the back. And I, I must have been about, uh, must have been about 15 or 16 in this, uh, this picture. This was right about when you left? Yeah, about the time I left, yeah. For more, more than a century, Indian residential schools separated over 150,000 Aboriginal children from their families and communities. Two primary objectives of these schools were to remove and isolate children from the influence of their homes, traditions, and cultures to assimilate them into the dominant culture. So the approximately 80,000 living former students and all family members and communities, the government of Canada now recognized that it was wrong to forcibly remove children from their homes. We now recognize that too often these institutions gave rise to abuse or neglect. Indeed, some thought as some thought as it was infamously said kill the Indian in the child tragically some of these children died while attending residential schools and others never returned home the fault of that uh, residential school system was uh, in the uh, early 1800s by a first prime minister who was uh, Johnny McDonald. And he was the one that, uh, that decreed that the children, or the children be separated from their homes and put in white schools and uh, get rid of their culture and, and uh, be like the white people, get rid of their language and their, their everything, their homes, and so this was done. You also received a monetary settlement. Do you think that was enough for, and fair for reconciliation? Well, you know, what is enough for anybody really, you know? You know, it's just a token. You know, like, depending, like, if you were sexually abused, you got more. It was all categorized, you know? 
So, I don't know, I only got about, I don't know, a little over a thousand, I think, something like that. But they said it was millions of dollars that they gave out. But I've yet to see that, you know. Yeah. You know, they, the uh, white people would say, you know, or native people would say, fork tongue to white people, you know. They were doing it then, you know, like today, you know. I talked to my sister about this, uh, my older sister, just her and I are alive. And uh, she told me that there was uh, some children, the babies were buried behind blue quills. And nobody said anything about Alberta. They said about Saskatchewan and they said about BC. Nothing about Alberta. And uh, for one, she did tell me that there was two boys that were uh, that were called by by a, a priest, no names. I don't know what she didn't tell me no names. And they went. They had this little box, and uh, they they went in the back of the school. Here's the school at the back over here. There was a barn over here and that, and that you know there was cows and stuff like that over here. They went in the back, and. The priest went somewhere and the boys opened the lid and there was a baby in there, a dead baby. And they shared that with, of course, you know, with other other boys and that, and girls and that. And that's how I knew, only knew, you know, about this, you know. And so when I found out, I read about this other children in uh, Kamloops, I thought, yeah, yeah, it happens, it happened, you know. I think we were treated like, like the black people in, in the United States. And that's another thing too, I just read again the other day that they had the same thing happening in, in the States and that they're starting to come out all this stuff. And that what good is it, you know, what good is it, you know? What, it, what is, is it gonna accomplish, really? It's, it's a, a black history that we have, you know? And the States have a black history too, you know? I guess uh, I married out of the reserve, okay. okay. My husband was uh, Italian-Canadian. And uh, I lost my status in 1962, I married out. My sister, Jenny, she married a French fellow. She lost her status. The only one that didn't lose her status was my sister because she married a, a Chipoyan from Ligoff. Neither did my brother lose his status because men didn't lose it. We were just rounded up like cattle, put in a cattle truck, and uh, brought to the Blue Quilt Residential School. And we were locked up in that. Actually locked up. You know, we couldn't go outside, you know, unless it's open, unlock the door and, hey, you can go play outside. It was just like uh, Nazis, you know. You described it as being in the Auschwitz. Yeah, that's right, that's right. You know, they made, well, they did, the children died too, eh, you know. And uh, our culture was, you know, beat out of us, really, you know. And uh, I did write a letter to the Edmonton Journal because they wanted to, they were fed up of it, eh, people. Or I don't know if it was, you know, the uh, Lagrange was the uh, uh, education minister in Alberta. And uh, they said, that's it, you know, we're fed up of it. Eh? Let's get rid of it out of the history books. Eh? When was this? And do not, just last year, they said, uh, you know, what, why do we want to know that? The kids don't need that. They don't understand that. They do understand that. You know, I taught grade two and grade six, and they understand what happened to, you know, residential schools and that to the Native people, especially the Native kids. They know that, you know? And that they don't want the white kids to know about it. It's history, you know? They'll never wipe it out, you know? And they're trying to.
Dancing to them tick. My name is Louis Lapatak. I'm 76 years old. I'm an elder from Sad Lake Band. I was born and raised in Kehuan Indian Reserve by my grandparents from 1945 to 1956. My grandparents were very traditional and the whole family spoke Cree. This was our culture. Thinking, acting, feeling, and living together. There was five of us grandchildren, and to my recollection, four of the oldest were already at Blue Quills Indian Residential School. Uh, while my siblings were away at the residential school, I used to follow my grandfather. Uh, we'd get up early in the morning to go get check the nets in the winter time as early as four o'clock in the morning, summertime about the same time, uh, like chopping wood, getting things ready, feeding horses, and uh, listening to his stories in the evening, listening to his, uh, uh, his singing. I used to travel with him to go all over to attend ceremonies like chicken dance, ghost dance, uh, sun dances. Our grandparents and other elders maintained the history, the laws, spiritualities, and traditions of the people. That was the life before we went to uh, residential school. My mom's school, then I go home. My Blue Quills Residence School um, from 1952 to 1965 I attended Blue Quills Indian Residence School I started at seven years old at that time my first language was Cree I didn't understand any English a grain truck came in and it had a big box. One was a driver and one had a piece of paper and spoke with uh, some of the people. And there was quite a few children and it was, we were put on a, this, this truck and we rode on the back. And uh, we got off at Blue Quills. One of the first thing they did to us was uh, take our clothes and we were given clothes coveralls, a pair of pants, of army boots, and they de-loused us with some kind of liquid that made our hair was very, very, very white. And I don't quite recall if we had haircuts right away, but they did give us uh, high haircuts, military haircuts. I was given the number, number 54. We were given numbers according to size. Number one, and I recall the last number was 80. There was about 80 boys in the school. We were given numbers to identify our clothes, our lockers, and our belongings. I ran away from school from grade seven, grade eight, grade nine, grade 10. That was one of the main reasons, it was the treatment. And I just had enough. Getting slapped, getting abused, uh, physical beatings, being called savage. We were relocated forcefully. Going to school was a loss of indigenous cultural teachings. There was enforcement of Christianity. Later on, we found out that we were there to be assimilated to take the Indian right out of us, introduce us a new religion, a new language, a new way of life. The schedule was very regimental, and uh, there was a lot of emphasis on religion. We'd pray about 10 times during the day. We had three meals a day. Sufficient, I guess, but not enough. During the night, we used to go, uh, go back to the dining room 
and help ourselves with bread. I don't know if you want to say you stole bread, but if you did get caught, then you'd get punished. Once a week, and I recall it was on Friday evenings, and we had an inspection uh, before showers, so they check up our, our clothes. If you had your clothes dirty, like say a dirty collar, a torn handkerchief or something like that, you would get, it mark you down for losing a mark. I was made to feel guilty because of the religion that affected me all my life and or affected some students. There's the religious teachings. It's hard to forgive them. We were told to try to forgive them for what they done to us. I guess in a way it is, but you can't forget. Missing church on Sundays, I used to feel a little guilty about that. And today, I kind of, I'm really, I'm almost relieved that a lot of the things I had to battle that were, especially a lot of the uh, religious instructions, I had to battle, get rid of it out of my body, start bringing in culture back in there again. Revitalize your language, bring it back. Uh, that's part of your culture, you know, participate in ceremonies, uh, talk to elders, talk, uh, visit them, because you learn from them. They have a lot of wise words, and they'll teach you lots about uh, the spiritual laws, the laws. And one of the things an elder told us was talk about forgiveness. He said, if you went to residence school and somebody done something to you, like a priest, a nun, a supervisor, write, write to that person a letter and say, I'm sorry, this is what you've done to me. And the next morning we had a ceremony and we burned a letter in a fire. You're supposed to forgive but it's hard. I suppose you can forgive. You can never totally forgive. You'll always remember because it affects you. You can never get rid of it. Sometimes <laughs> Mi chet ki goi apu nuan kisk sin magnas ki tan kiaps ksna matukam ko ke tuhtal mo taps kuts ko tagay sino ay miu yakao residence ko kan tau pitwet mo kini paus tam maga ati mi na mi chet kas ki tau ko te ke tuhtet ni mi te ne pe tuhtet ano ta ka pe sa chuan u ya gatse gam sa ga me ka kini yawan he made the man man gane hio arms, minam stay arch moon ekta. Magaya. He said to whip the man and ask him how go water. Kiaps and tap with ten, Kimusum no man, which you were. Kaki swam and tatu gisco, coys the mass work, kaki yogi work, mamma water skier. Kaka me wear mina. Eka kapume, eka kwe suhkatsia. Na nasku maan tain, sai hai.
I was about seven years old when I went there. Yeah, about seven. Because I remember everything, you know. But nothing but work. No schooling. But what do you do? There's nothing I can do. And I know to get up sometimes, not just me alone. There was a lot of boys that working in the barnyard, milking cows and stuff. Sometimes I have to go in in church in the morning, you know, serving mass to the priest. And uh, after after school, I have to go upstairs, change my clothes, then go to the barn and milk cows. See my finger here? That's from milking. And uh, we milk, I don't know how many cows, there was a lot because there was a lot of kids. They, they don't, they hurt me a lot, you know. If I, if I, when I went there, mom and dad figured that I'm gonna learn something, you know, I learned bad things, that's about it. What I seen, what they did was absolutely wrong. They don't even tell the parents when the kid is dying and they bury them like that. You know, they should tell the parents at least, have the right kind of funeral, but they didn't, and that was very, very wrong. I don't know what they're going to do with that because they'll never finish paying for it. We didn't even know that. Where they buried them, we don't know. Because I never seen a graveyard, not when I was there. Fleed. They fleed from uh, from where from where we were. Some of my relatives fleed into the bush so that they could uh, prevent their children from being abducted by those Indian agents. I call it abduction because that's what I I believe it is. And when the settlement opened up in Gift Lake, a lot of the people decided to take the script and, and go reside in Gift Lakes to prevent us, kids like myself, to be to come and get taken. I grew up with the Cree language. I spoke Cree fluently till I was 15. Like the whole community spoke Cree. And when I had to go to school, I could not understand any word of English. And we were disciplined for skin Cree, even though it wasn't a residential school. And I do remember the nuns being really harsh to us and slapping us on our hands if we tried to speak, uh, if we spoke Cree. And I know for a fact that many of my relatives fleed. They fleed from, uh, from, where, from where we were. Some of my relatives fleed into the bush so that they could uh, prevent their children from being abducted by those Indian agents. I call it abduction because that's what I, I believe it is. And when the settlement opened up in Gift Lake, a lot of the people decided to take the script and, and go reside in Gift Lakes to prevent us, kids like myself, to, be, to come and get taken. Uh, my father was uh, passed away when I was 12 years old, so I've never had the opportunity to ever talk to him about residential schools. In fact, I didn't even know that he went to residential schools until I was in my late 30s, early 40s. 
So knowing that my father went to residential school, I started asking some questions, but there were very few people that could answer the questions for me. Um, the, the more I went to school, the less I spoke Cree, uh, which is really shameful because that's where our natural laws are. That's where the whole, our whole way of being uh, or how we're supposed to live is in the language. The spirit is in the language. It shows us compassion. It shows us kindness. It shows us how to be in relationship with one another. It, it's about kinship. Members of the nearby Saddle Lake Cree Nation say they've been finding human remains since the mid-2000s. The remains were in a community graveyard, but not in coffins. It was one of the most horrific residential schools in Canada. The institution was strife with violence, illness, starvation, abuse and death. Eric Laird is the lead researcher and says they had the documents to prove it. The amount of Missing children is extensive. It can be safely stated that in our community of 12,000 people, each family has had four to five children who went missing from this institution. Jason Whiskey Jack is a counselor at Saddle Lake. We need to find, to find out if there's any more in that area. The two men say that they have come across remains while burying current members who have passed away. We came across a, a rib, small rib cage and uh, attached to a spine, and then more infilling. We came across a small skull. When I hit a lot of these graves, uh, you know, there, there's no there's no supports for us. There's the records. Out the band there. is yeah. asking the we federal government for help it. in using ground penetrating radar to help find the remains of their children and to help with a wellness center to assist in any members suffering from trauma.
the accidental excavation occurred while our community members were digging graves. It was excavated where the children size skeleton remains such as skulls, uh, from your bones, leg bones, arm bones, rib cages and spines. The mass grave had numerous ch children size skeletons wrapped in white cloth. Radar. Community members say these revelations at Satellite Cree Nation are further proof that children were buried without proper care and respect. It's a huge discovery for us because a lot of the younger generation didn't know about this sort of stuff. For myself, uh, I was shocked. The First Nation wants funding from the federal government for mental health support and for ground-penetrating radar devices. We've disclosed to them that there were accidental excavations and they still... The, we haven't received anything, nothing at all. Indigenous Services Canada and Crown Indigenous Relations say the findings shared today result from this shameful part of our country's history. It says the Satellite Cree Nations has received more than $7 million over the past three years in mental wellness funding, but members say they've been historically underfunded. We have a lot of descendants and we have a big community that requires these supports. Supports they say will be crucial to let them process and heal.
I can't understand why people that profess to be walking with God would come and ruin the lives of our people, our children, creating damages that is felt for decades and, and still keeps haunting us. You could see it in the, the suicides of our young kids, the incarceration rates of our people, the high rates of child welfare, which in my eyes is another form of residential school. And, and now the mass graves, like how much pain can one endure? And what can we, how can this healing start? So we We lift up with gratitude the efforts of all those who are seeking to honor the sacred lives of the children who went missing from residential schools and whose fates are unknown to those who held them most dear. The loss of their giftedness is our collective loss. They died alone with no one to cry for them, though they had mothers and fathers, grandmothers, aunties and cousins who missed and loved them.